Father, Creator, God, Lord, we stand before you. You are our all in all. You are our everything, our Prince of Peace. And by the power of your word, transform our lives today. By the power of your word, may we grow. May we learn. May we hear so that we're ready for all of the work that you have for us, God. It's all just so we can do these things for you. All this we pray for Christ's glory and the furtherance of the kingdom in Christ Jesus. Amen. Today's Bible study is like Bible college. It's very much today like a situation where you want a pen and a piece of paper and you want to write down. Sometimes we do these life lesson things where the scripture is speaking. Today is so much more than, uh, it's, it's, it's like being in school again. For you guys that like school, I think that's Leah, everybody else hated school, you're going to have a great time. For you guys that hated school, sorry. Not really, but yes. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 6 is where we're going to pick it up. However, go back with me real quick to Hebrews 5, picking up in verse 12. Let me read what Paul's, or whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, he was telling the Jewish believers. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Please give me your attention. It might not seem like it because of the style in which we speak. That is a heavy duty rebuke. That's a smack on their spiritual behinds like no other they've ever received. Let me put it to you in modern day terms like this. How long you've been walking with the Lord and you're still struggling with relationships? How long have you been walking with the Lord and you're still struggling with finances? How long have you been walking with the Lord and you're still struggling with anger? How long have you been walking with the Lord and you're still struggling going from job to job? How? That's basically what he says to them. He's looking at them and then he's telling them, I think somebody's slaughtering a kid out there. <laughs> Bludgeoning him with something. Thank you. Let's put it a little practically. Some people, he says, it doesn't matter how long they're in church, they haven't gotten past the milk stage. You guys might know that the Bible calls Jesus Christ the bread of life. He is the bread of life. He is literally, at one point, he literally told his apostles and his disciples that were following him, you must eat my body and drink my blood. And they went, ew, that's disgusting. What are you talking about? And he looked at me and went, he says, don't you know that I'm talking about spiritual things? Don't you get it? And that's how Paul, speaking to the church in the, of, of Jews, that's how I am speaking to some of you. How long have you been walking with the Lord now? Now listen, if you in this church and you're new in the Lord, maybe two, three, even four years, the things that you're going to learn today are exactly where you're supposed to be. But if any longer than that, and you have not not just the knowledge of these things I'm going to go over with you today, but the experience. You see it says here, by reason of use, their senses exercised to discern both. It's not just knowing these things. It's just not the knowledge. You can't just study God's Word and go, okay, well now I'm spiritual. The first lesson I learned when I got out of prison in 1997, and I spent the last two plus years studying God's Word, finishing Bible college, man, I was so sure I knew the Bible better than, only to find out this, Bible knowledge is not spirituality. Knowing the Bible doesn't bring you closer to God. It's a great tool in your box. Absolutely. It's a wonderful thing to have as a resource to call upon God's Word in your heart and your mind. But just knowing the Bible doesn't make you a good Christian. Do you understand that? It's having these things applied in your life. 
with that thought in mind, again, I'm going to tell you, the things that you're going to hear about today are the milk of the word. As a babe, you need to know these things. Now, again, if you're struggling in relationships, if you're struggling in finances, if you're struggling consistency, if you're struggling one thing at a time, struggle, 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 and you're walking with the Lord, these are the things you need to know, guys. These are the things you need to exercise. These are the things that you need to understand and have put into use. And when you do, you're going to find more peace and more joy and more freedom and more understanding of the plan that God has for your life just by these six things we're going to look at today. I guarantee it. I promise you it. And why could I do that with such confidence? Because it's God's Word and I believe it's real. Because this is what the Bible says. All right. Verse 1, chapter 6, the book of Hebrews. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. That word for perfection means completion. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, of eternal judgment. This we will do if God permits. Paul lists the things that he should go over with them if time Time permits. Guess what, guys? Time permits. <laughs> For us, anyway. So we're going to go over them. The first thing at the top of the page is... Is... Drew, <laughs> repentance from dead works. You see, he lists the things that are the milk. He lists the things that are what he calls, ready, the elementary principles. The first thing is repentance of dead works. The word repentance in the Greek is the word metanoia. You see, it says metanoia. Man, give me that pointer. This will be so cool. I've often wanted to be a teacher. <laughs> No, I don't want to get it. I didn't expect it. Metanoia occurs hundred, over a hundred times in Scripture. I put three of the times that it occurs in Scripture just for study. Now, you could write these Scripture down, or, you ready? Does anybody not know what a Strong's Concordance is? If you're new to Scripture, if you're not sure what they are, you have a ton of... T oh, man, I get a pointer. Oops. And now I need a glove. <laughs> oh! So I have no idea how excited I am. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to take a look at this one. The word metanoia occurs over a hundred times. Love it. Love it. What was I saying? <laughs> Strong's Concordance. Strong's Concordance. And there is a book, God bless you, as a resource called a Concordance. A Concordance has every word that's in the Bible. And you can not only cross-reference for what the word means, where it occurs in Scripture, it's assigned a number. So when you're looking at the Bible and you read... Um, Repentance from dead works. You can look up the word repentance, see how many times it occurs in scriptures, see where it occurs, see the different tenses, because the Greek language is much more detailed than our English. It has different, was it a participle? Was it infinite? Was All these different things you can look up and get a greater understanding of what Paul was saying in Matt. Now here's the amazing thing. Guys, if you never pick up a concordance and do these things, it doesn't change your salvation. It doesn't, nothing changes. The greatest thing about looking at scripture, it's deep enough that you can dive in and never touch the bottom. The, the, the most intelligent genius of all time, they still study scripture in colleges as a, as a textbook, people who don't even know the Lord Jesus, and yet, simple enough, that the child, that, that, that those people that are over there, the dozen or so volunteers are teaching your children scripture and they're being blessed by it. Isn't that amazing about God's word? Try to do that with any other book. Try to pick up the, say, Atlas Shrugged and try to do, it, it can't happen. There's, a, there's a, a wonderful, blessed magic even about scripture where it changes your life in the application and yet excites your mind, your senses. Point is, 
2 Timothy 2.19 says, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Hey guys, first thing he says, of course you have to understand, you can't be, when I was Catholic, the greatest thing about being Catholic was, I'd go to church on Sundays, well, when I went to church on Sundays, and it was like, I was like, boom, I went to church, I'm free, I got the cookie, I'm free, what are you talking about? And then Monday would roll around and I'd sin Monday, I'd sin Tuesday, I'd sin when, and I'm talking sin, I'm, I'm, I'm talking wicked, foul, filthiness, right? And then I go back on Sunday, boom, got the cookie, gave a couple of bucks in the box, I'm free, I'm, I'm forgiven. Thinking that God was really going to forgive me, there was no metanoia, there was no repentance. Look what the word repentance means, guys. Change of mind, change of mind, or short definition, change of the inner man. A repentant heart is not a heart that says, hey, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old, some of you know. And they bite each other, they pinch each other, they take each other's games, they're short. And we say, you better ask, for, sorry, 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 sorry. And the other one has to say, I forgive you. And now, because we're trying to get them to understand it, it's become so mechanic. But I said I was sorry, but I said I was sorry, but I said I was sorry. But why did you pinch your sister? She was bothering me. <laughs> she was frustrating me. But the whole point is to learn that you don't keep doing that. I said I was sorry. Can't do that to God, guys. If you've truly repented, that's why I'm not real big on the whole uh, come forward and kneel at the cross thing. Although I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all in churches I do, I praise God for them. But i rather see the change. You know what? You can make a decision for Christ in your seat and we'll see if it's real. We'll watch your life if you stick around here. Otherwise, you can go to a church where they don't watch your life and it's so much easier, right? Look at number two, Colossians 1.10, that you walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Increasing in the knowledge of God, keeping Scripture and understanding of Scripture, and walk worthy. Oh, are you, you laying on us now a, 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 a legalist trip? Oh, do this and do that. I went to a church and they say you shouldn't do that. The book of Jude says that some people use the grace of God as an excuse to sin. I'm not laying a trip on nobody. I'm just telling you, if the, if the change in your heart, if the acceptance of Christ is real, this is the milk, of course. Of course, even the world knows it. You punch somebody in the face, you, 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 you do something, steal something from work, you're a Christian. The world even knows, you're a Christian and you do that? That's called a blown witness. I mean, you lost your salvation, of course, but it's a blow, you've blown your witness. Number three, John, the Lord Jesus speaking. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. You see that? Repentance from dead works. This is the milk. Of course you know that. Well, I went to this church, and it was a universalist church, and they told me I can live my life any way I wanted, and, and the guy at Duck's Dynasty says this, but A&E says that, and that. Milk. Leave. When I came to the Lord, the first thing he did was start taking things from me that I really liked. Don't take that, please. It's, you're not going to like it in the end. You're not going to like what... No, 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 I like that, but I really like... In the end, it's going to cost you your life. No, 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 please, please, please. And God, sometimes He takes it. And sometimes He says, okay, when you're ready to give it, I'll take it. And there's no way of knowing except ready by exercising your senses, discerning good and evil, allowing God to knock on your heart. I swear I thought it was God and He told me to do that. I swear I thought it was God and He told... And you're going to learn, and that's how you discern. That's your, this is the milk of the word. Now, I want you to see what you didn't see. It didn't say giving your money is the milk of the word. You're not going to find anywhere on our list giving money. You know what? That's between you and the Lord. The Bible says God loves a cheerful. Some people think, well, I don't want to go to church because I don't have to give you money. How about you can come to church, keep your money. And then what? Well, when God knocks on your heart and you go past the elementary principles, you'll learn that. Well, does your church speak in tongues? 
Some people do and some people don't. Well, I don't see that on your list because it's not an elementary principle. Well, I went to a church and they said, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. Well, that's not in scripture, is it? Is it? Elementary principles. Next one. Faith toward God. Next. Oh, I got the thing, don't I? Watch this. Boom! Uh-oh. Man, I lost my pointer. Is it there? Oh. There it is. Faith toward God. The word faith occurs over 250 times in Scripture. It's the word pistis, which means belief, trust, confidence, fidelity, faithfulness. Faith toward God. Of course that you understand that the first couple of years you have to exercise your faith. You want me to give you the example that my pastor gave me that set the light off in my head? This is a chair. This is a chair. I look at it and I see that it's made of metal. I hope that the rivets and, and the bolts and soldering is still good. I'm about to sit in this chair. You see me? Watch. Ready? I'm going to keep my legs wide. A little more weight, a little more. Uh, okay. It's okay. Pastor, what are you doing? It took faith to sit in that chair. I believed that that chair was going to withhold my weight. I believed that in sitting in that chair, I wasn't going to fall and make a fool of myself. I believed that sitting in that chair, I had faith in that chair. God says, do that to me. Do that with me. Have some faith in me. Give me your life. Give me your relationship. Give me your finances. Give me your worries. Give me your doubts. Give me your fears. Have some faith. Exercise your faith even. Take something that usually freaks you out and just instead of putting in the electric bill, uh, the phone, the f just say Jesus. But God. But God, look at, look at Hebrews 11.6. He says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He says, you can't, if you don't have faith, you can't even please God. Now again, milk, the beginning, the understanding of these things. If you're new to scripture, don't feel bad. Man, my faith is always weak. If you're new to church, less than five years, this is normal. I mean, I want you to understand that the spirit grows even slower than the body. So me, as a Christian, I'm walking with the Lord almost 20 years. And the Lord goes, oh, you're a big boy. You're 20 years old. You're a big boy. I'm a big boy, God. Yeah, you're a big boy. You're 20. So if you're walking with the Lord seven, eight years, you've been in a church seven, eight years, and God goes, oh, you're a big boy. You're seven, eight years old. Oh, no, but I've read the Bible three or four times. And he goes, oh, that's very good. I'm so proud of you. So if you're less than that, guys, go easy on yourself. Don't, don't, the legalistic part is if I was sitting here going, now of course, oh, you know that you go to my church and you better, that's legalism. Now I'm teaching you. Listen to me. All these things I learned. All these things that we're going over I learned. Look at the next one. Galatians 3.22, but the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. It is your faith that saves you. Of course you know that. It's not works. You can work all these things. You can read all these things. You can work the Bible. You can come here and serve. And you can go be as, going as much to hell as, as Hitler himself. You've got to believe that you've been set free from sin by Christ. It's the faith. You understand that? Well, oh, I don't understand how that works. If I, but you say that I should work, but then if I work, I still, still might be going. Yeah. These are the things that you have to utilize, you have to use. You'll come to a fuller understanding. on. There's no way of knowing them from the beginning. I read it and I know it. Have you lived it out yet? Not yet. Then how do you say you know? Because I read it. It's not like that. He didn't say, I want you to know these things because you know the scripture. He says you have to live them out by exercise. Are you understanding me? If you read a book 
on fixing a vehicle. And here's the book, and here, you guys pick up the manual to your car and you read it, and here's the, if you've never done it, man, you're gonna be all like, I know how to change the belts on my car, how? Because I read a book. Have you ever done it before? But I read the book. I'm gonna tell you a story. This is a great lesson. I've learned this and I've told this story. Some of you guys have been in our church a while ago. Oh, I know that story. There was a professor, a very wise professor in a class, and he had his college class, and he wanted to teach them an understanding of how they really learn. Are you with me? He took half the class and he told them, I want you to make a vase. You know, a vase that you put flowers in. I want you to make three of them. You have one month to do it. I want you to spare no expense. I want you to take every bit of this month. I want you to make the most beautiful vase you can make. And the other half of the class, he says, I want you to make 50 vases. I want you to make them I want, your time is short. It's going to take you a long time. You have a month. I want 50 vases. Do you call it a vase or a vase? Vase. Are you laughing at me? I'm not perfect, you know. I'm sorry, Mr. Perfect. <laughs> At the end of the month, the first three vases came in. And looking at the vase, the guy's like, that's a, that's a nice job. You look at them and they were, they were symmetrical, they were nice. The three vases were nice. But when they got in those other 50, well, the first 10 were kind of weak. The second 10 were actually quite nice. By the time they got to the last 15 or 20, they were nicer than the three the other side of the class made. You know why? You ready? Because you learn more from your mistakes than you do your successes. And that's through your whole life. You're going to learn more. When me and Austin are building cages for my animals, we first, we first thing we do is slap the whole thing, just put it together. And then we figure out how to modify it. Oh, well, I bet if we change this in the next one, if we change this in, and we just, by the time we're getting to seven, eight, nine cages down, man, we got it down pat. Now we're ready to market it, even sell it if we need to. Do you understand that's the same way? Have you not tried these things? Have you not put them into practice? Well, I already know them. But if you don't put them into practice, faith in God is it's hard. It's hard, man. You look at your check at the end of the week and it says 542, and then, but pastor said you should give 10% to God, 54 bucks, man. That's gas money for the week to get to work. I can't do it. Can't do it. Sorry, God, I can't tithe this week. There's not enough money. God says, come on, have some faith. Take the 54. Give it to somebody who has less than you do and watch God bless you. That's faith, guys. That's faith. Mark 9, 23, Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. All things are possible to him who believes. Next, doctrine of baptisms. It starts over there. Doctrine of baptisms. So he goes from... Repentance from dead works, faith toward God, doctrine of baptisms. Baptisms. In Scripture, there are listed no less than ten different baptisms. There's a baptism by fire. There's a baptism to the Holy Spirit. There's a baptism to the body of Christ. Oh, but I read one time where it said there is one baptism. That's talking about being baptized into the body of Christ. Be careful when you twist Scripture. Be careful. Be careful. Understanding with the reading. 1 Corinthians 12 says, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, all have been made to drink into one Spirit. So there's the baptism. The first baptism is when you get saved. You're literally baptized into the body. Now I want you to know this word for baptism occurs also. There's about four or five different words for it. It occurs over a hundred times also in the New Testament and Old Testament. It's the word baptizo in Greek, which means to submerge, to dip, to baptize, but specifically of ceremonial dipping. I baptize. That's the tense of the word. <coughs> Submerging into. So you're baptized into the body. You're completely submerged. When you get saved, you're baptized into the body of Christ. No longer white, black, Asian, no longer Hispanic, Portuguese, Brazilian, whatever. No longer. You're a Christian now. 
you're a Christian, and your brothers and your sisters, they might look a little different than you. I get afraid of white churches. I get panicked at black churches. It is not scriptural. Now, it's, it's American, and it's understandable. People like to be around people that look and act like them, especially when they're new. But once you've grown up, that, that stuff shouldn't bother you anymore. We're all baptized into the body. Do you understand that? <clears throat> Acts 2.38 Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Two different baptisms he talks about there. First he says, I want you to repent, which is what we talked about, repent, and then be baptized. The first thing you should do after you accept Christ as your Savior, the first act of obedience is a water baptism. We do water baptisms every few months. We go down to the beach. Boom, fully submerging you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? It's another baptism. Next. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me. Now, the guy that's speaking these words, anybody remember who that was? John the Baptist, excellent work. John the Baptist, speaking of the Lord Jesus, he whose sandals I am not worthy to carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. That's another two different bat Holy Spirit and fire. What's a Holy Spirit? Listen to me. After a few years of walking with the Lord, when you really get serious, when your heart turns from service out of fear to service in love, God does this crazy thing where he baptizes you. Now, I was bat when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, I asked uh, Pastor John Cinelli to pray over me, and he prayed over me. And as I was walking away from him, I felt this weird, watery thing just almost like a baptism of love upon me. Just, I was like, ooh, that was weird. Was that the first time I got the Holy Spirit chill bumps? All right, good. You know, I'm not a big thing. He also talks about a baptism of fire. What's that? Listen, if you're going through hell right now in your life and you're walking with the Lord and you think that God doesn't like you or he's mad at you because you've done something, don't. You're being baptized by fire. If you want to purify gold, you know what you got to do? You melt it down. Get all the impurities out. And to God, you are gold. And he's going to melt you down. Anybody punish their kids? Nobody here punishes their kids, right? Why do you punish your kids? Because you love them. And you want them to do what's right. And you want to get the best out of them. And you want them to get the best out of life, right? Right? All these different baptisms. Now listen, I'm, not, I'm trying to run through these things fast, but remember, this word occurs over a hundred times. You don't know these things yet? You haven't learned these things yet? Well, you're learning some of them today, and I encourage you to not only be writing notes, to get this, the tape, um, what's his name? Andrew will have it online. You can, you can look at this stuff later on. Why? Because you want to be skilled. You want to get past the milk. Now, for some of you guys might be brand new. It's like, look, this is already beyond me. Well, then suffer through it because every once in a while, there's a little plate of broccoli in front of you. And if you don't like broccoli, you eat it anyway. You know why? Because it's good for you. Yeah, today's message might be a little long-winded, might be a little bit more studious than you're used to it. Man, it's, I, I got out of school for a reason. Listen, 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 listen. I barely graduated high school. I graduated six months late. I'm with you. I don't like school either. But this type of school is good for you. And if you want, again, more peace, more joy, more strength in saying no to your sins, if you're one of those people that every time you stumble really bad, you go, man, I did it again. I know God's going to be mad. Why can't I say no to that guy? If you're a girl, of course, you'd say that. <laughs> Some of you guys might even say that. And that's okay. You know what I mean? That's between you and God. But if that's you, these, these are the things you need to know. These are the things that if you exercise them will give you strength to say no to your sin. This is what you're lacking. If I'm speaking to you and all these things are like, man, I didn't know that. And then you're looking at your life, but well, this is what's lacking in your life, guys. The knowledge of these things. Man, there's a lot to know in Christianity. Can I just believe in Jesus? Absolutely. Well, can I still go to heaven if I don't know these things? Absolutely. But if you read the manual, you'll get a whole lot more out of your car. 
If you didn't realize that your car has a camera on it when you back up and because you haven't turned the button on, some of you guys don't realize there's a, an overdrive when you're on the highway, you put the car in fifth, it'll save a lot of gas, you'll, you will yeah, my car has it? Some of you guys, they have this thing called an emergency brake. Most of you guys never even touch it. <laughs> it's the same thing. The Lord Jesus said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. And some of you guys are like, I'm not living an abundant life. I'm walking with the Lord 10 years and I don't have an abundant life. Well, duh. Don't you want to know why? Or are you just satisfied that you're going to heaven? And you can be. This life ain't for everybody. Man, this is hard work to learn these things and to exercise these things. Man, I sat down in that chair. Wasn't like sitting down in the Lord, believe me. Learning the lessons about tithing, learning the lessons about purity. The first time you had to say no to somebody who wanted to have sex with you, when you knew it was the wrong thing to do. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Some of you guys don't. And I thank God for you guys. You know how hard that is sometimes? Oh, my goodness. Oh, why don't I just go, go home to your wife? No, let me not go home to your wife. No. Is it struggle like that for you? You bet. But the more you learn these things, the more you exercise, the more you have faith, and you realize something, it's the craziest thing. And I'll never forget the first time I went home and I went, the world lied to me. The world lied to me. They told me the more sex partners I have, the more fun I would have. The world told me the more women I could conquer, the better, the more fun it was. I didn't know until it was almost 15 years later. Wow. One woman is the greatest blessing in the world. You don't got to worry about anything. You could put your head on the pillow at night and know you've done the right thing. And probably she has too, because you have. It's the greatest feeling in the world, guys, to be with one woman. I'm with the same woman 20 years now. 20 years. Only her. That's it. Amen. Now you guys look at me and you go, well, duh, for you, that's going to be easy. Not too many women are looking at you. Listen, I know. There's, <laughs> listen, I ain't the best looking dude in the world. I got that. <laughs> and it hasn't been always easy. I'm sure for her, you guys that know my wife, she's stunning. But I thank God that she's done that for me. And it's great to know that you don't have to worry about what the world has to worry about. Protection from this and shot for that. And when you're pregnant and you go, hallelujah, she's pregnant instead of, what am I going to do? I'm pregnant. Horrible. Horrible. Imagine that. Listen, guys, I think I talked about this a couple months ago. If you never, ever want to wind up in a drug program, never drink a beer. Never. You'll never wind up in a drug program. It's the craziest thing. If you don't want to wind up in an abortion clinic, don't sleep around. It's simple. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? Yeah. Next subject, the laying on of hands. Now, some people confuse the laying on of hands, but every time the laying on of hands occurs in Scripture, it's referring to prayer. So we're going to apply it to prayer. Have you not learned about prayer? Mark 1.35, Now in the morning, having risen a long time while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Speaking of the Lord Jesus. As a matter of fact, in another place, it says, as was his custom. Do you not know that the Lord Jesus was a man of prayer every day? Do you know the Bible also says that the Lord Jesus was a carpenter? So you know what that means, guys? He got up early in the morning and then got up double early in the morning to pray because he thought that prayer was more important than anything else. He didn't go to sleep late and go, oh my goodness, the guy wants me to be there work at 6 o'clock. That's when the sun comes up. There's no electricity in this stinking town. Man, when are they going to invent electricity? So I can work at night and I can sleep late. No, he got up while it was still dark, spent time in prayer with his father because the Lord Jesus knew it was important. And he had decisions to make and he had trials ahead of him. And he knew what prayer would do for him if he spent time in prayer. And if it was good enough for him, it was good enough for me, right? Amen. Verse, I'm sorry, the second verse we're looking at. 
Matthew 6, 6, but when you pray, this is the Lord Jesus doing the speaking, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will, will reward you openly. Now, this particular word for prayer, now there's a few different words, is the word desis. It means a need, entreaty. It also means supplication, prayer. It occurs between the Old and New Testament over 300 times. It occurs over 100 times alone in the New Testament. Now, why am I saying all these things? And it occurs 100 times. It occurs 100 times. God's saying, listen, these are the basic principles. I speak about them often. Repentance of dead works, we speak about them often. Uh, laying on of hands, the uh, faith toward God, the doctrine of... Hundreds of times I speak of them. It's the first thing you need to know. This is the milk. Prayer, I talk to people all the time. And you know, I'm just so angry and I, I can't, I get so mad. Well, tell me about your prayer life. Well, I, you know, I pray in the shower before I go to work and I'm always praying when I'm driving my car. And that's great. I, I think that's, that's a wonderful time to pray. But that is, man, that's, that's, like, the, that's like putting the icing on the cake. That shouldn't be your, your steady diet of prayer. The Lord Jesus said, when you pray. Notice he didn't say, if you pray. He didn't say, in case you feel like praying. <laughs> He said, when you pray, you go into a room, close the door behind you, and your Father will, will, will reward you openly for what you're doing in secret. What an awesome promise that is. And the third verse I, I uh, referenced very intentionally, Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, speaking of the wives, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Two things happen in there. Heirs together of the grace of life. Some people do not believe that a husband and wife will spend eternity together in heaven because of certain verses they pick out. And you might be right, but I take this verse as the fact that me and my wife are going to be together forever in heaven. We're, we're heirs together of the grace of life. I'm going to spend eternity with her. If I don't start now, I don't want to spend heaven trying to get it right. I'm going to try and get it right now. Because when we get to heaven, I want to have lots of fun. Notice it says prayers may be hindered. Listen to me. Married couples, if you don't pray with your wife... You are breaking scripture. This is 101. If you're a couple here and you go into my office, y'all, can you counsel with us? We're having absolutely. I know I have problems with my wife sometimes too. The first thing I say to you is, you guys praying together? Oh no, but let me tell you what happened. I go, ah, 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 ah. no, no, no. This week I want you to pray together every day and then come back next week. Oh, but let me tell you what happened. Listen to me. Listen to me. It really doesn't matter what happened. What's important is that you guys are praying together. Oh, but let if you're not doing milk, I'm not going to give you steak. You don't take the baby that you have that's one year old and start sticking hunks of steak in his mouth. You give him milk. Milk. Married couples, milk. Pray together. Of course. Of course. Um... Prayer. Next. Resurrection of the dead. He speaks now. We're, we're coming to a close, guys. Stay with me. I, I knew the, the, uh, the, the class is almost over. The Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that He was buried and He rose again the third day according to Scripture. He says it's milk to understand that there is a resurrection of the dead. Listen, you don't die and go nowhere. Christ didn't die and go nowhere. Of course you don't believe in reincarnation, do you? Of course you don't believe in ashes to ashes, dust to dust, you die and that's it. You don't believe that. This is the milk of the This is the beginner stuff, guys. Of course you understand. Look at number two. Jesus answers to them, you are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Listen, let me tell you what happened here. A bunch of guys who thought they were so smart, they came to the Lord Jesus and they said to him, Hey, listen, there was a guy who had a wife, right? And he died. So then he had another, she had another husband and another husband, seven husbands. Therefore, when the resurrection occurs, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. 
And he said, you think you're so smart. You come up with your worldly reasons why God can't be God. You come up with all, but it can't make it. God says, you err. You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to God, to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. When the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at the teaching. Let me explain to you, so in case you don't understand what he's saying. He's not saying, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the God. As in, they are here with me in heaven. They didn't die and go to someplace else. I am the God of all. And you never really die. You just move. And you can move to heaven or you can move to hell. Choice is yours. And in order to get to hell, you're going to have to jump over the dead body of God's son, Jesus. Literally. Because he will throw his body in front of you over and over again and say, come to me, come to me. Nope, not interested. And you're going to have to jump over and jump over. Of course you understand the resurrection of the dead. Now, I love this aspect of the resurrection of the dead. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. This explains it to me perfectly. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some say among you there is no resurrection of the dead? Because if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up in, if in fact the dead don't rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if in this life we only have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. You hear what he says there? Now let me paraphrase that. If you don't believe that Christ rose from the dead and all you think is that Jesus was a really great philosopher, he had a really great way of life, if he was your guru, he said, then you are to be pitied above all men. What a sad thing to think. If you don't believe in an afterlife and that all you live is the 80 plus years, like my pastor used to say, if all your life is, is a blip, you ever go to the, it's a good idea to go, go to a, a cemetery and look around. Born dead. Born, died. Born, died. And then you got that little line right in between. Ever see the line? Born. If all you think of is that line and that's it, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. So how pitiful. That is sad. And do you know how many Christians don't understand the resurrection of the dead? Of course there's a resurrection of the dead. And of course Christ was the first one that rose. You don't know that. You don't believe that. You don't look forward to that. You don't hope in that. You don't trust in that. Keep drinking milk. I can't figure out why you can't grow past this stuff. Resurrection of the dead. Next, eternal judgment. I think this is the last one, guys. You've made it. Yes, this is the last one. You've made it. You've made your class. It's got to be 40 minutes. Whew. Could have been at home watching something. <laughs> now, this is a big one. Guys, this is a really big one. Because it's very popular in modern American churches today that hell doesn't exist. There's a guy named Rob Bell, one of the best teachers of our generation. Rob Bell, man, he is a great teacher. But he is what's called a universalist. He doesn't believe in hell. Matter of fact, he says that love wins. He wrote a whole book, big popular book, so millions of copies. Love wins. That God's love wins out over death. God's love wins out over hell. And it's a wonderful book. It's a great read and it's so nice. It's alive from the pit of hell but it's nice. There's a guy named Tony Campolo who was really popular when I was a young Christian whose son preaches. Him and his son both preach this heretical crap. And at one time proclaiming from the pulpit, if God sends people to hell, then I don't want nothing to do with that God. This is a very big preacher. This, this guy is popular, man. 
Thousands of people go to his church. But what did the scriptures have to say? First of all, again, man, I forgot to read you the word. And it's a cool word. Look at this. Going back to resurrection of the dead. Anastasis. Anast where they get, you never hear the word, the, the name Anastasia? That's a derivative of risen from the dead. Occurs over a hundred times in scriptures as well. You know what I found really weird? The, it, that almost all these words were a, a feminine noun? Huh. <laughs> Wouldn't believe that. Now, eternal judgment, I bet that's a feminine word too, isn't it? <laughs> yep, there it is. <laughs> Thought so. Matthew 10, 28. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, that is one of the most misunderstood scriptures in all the Bible. Who can kill the body and soul and cast it into hell? Only God. Not the devil. He says, don't be afraid of the devil. Only kill somebody. Now, if the Lord Jesus, and I want you to know this, that the Lord Jesus mentioned hell in scripture more than he mentioned heaven. Then how do men say there's no hell? How do they do it? How do they lie to us? Because it's not nice and it doesn't bring people in. Some of you guys might not come back next week because I said that you'll go to hell if you don't accept Jesus as your savior. I can't believe he just said that. He said it again. He says it all the time. I'm not going to stop saying it. If you want to go to heaven that th that's in this book, it says you have to accept Jesus. What if I don't accept Jesus? You can't go to the heaven in this book. Well, I don't want to go to the heaven in that book. Fair enough. Fair enough. Where do you want to go? I want to go to Utopia. Fine. I got a better idea. You make up your own place. Call it Bleen. You want to go to Bleen. You be the god of Bleen, and you make heaven, whatever heaven is, to Bleen, and you bring people there. Sounds stupid, doesn't it? Of course it sounds stupid. This book says there's a place called heaven, and it's a wonderful place, and he wants to bring you there. And the open-minded thing is that, oh, you don't have to do nothing but believe in his son to get there. Well, I don't want to do that. 2 Peter 2.4 for, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment Peter speaking about eternal judgment said that God didn't even spare the angels who sinned that hell was actually created hell is a few different words in scripture there's Tarturo in the original language there's Gehenna there's Sheol there's all these different names for hell that hell was created for the angels who disobeyed in the beginning. That they are down in there now. They are locked in chains in hell, reserved for eternal judgment. Meaning, when Christ comes back, he's coming back as a conquering king. And the world will give up what is inside the hell. And he will ravage this earth with pestilence and violence as never such seen. And Christian, you don't got to worry about that though because you ain't going to be here. You're getting raptured. Well, I didn't see nothing about no rapture in there. That's right, you didn't. Nothing about pre-trib, post-trib. You know why? Because that's going on to perfection. That's going on to deeper things. Don't worry about that. Just worry about hell right now. And don't worry about anything else about the, except the person that could send you there. That's God, the Lord Jesus. You don't have to worry about it, though, if you know him. Let's finish up this part. Revelation 1.18, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen? Amen? And I have the keys of Hades and death. He has the keys. You know what that means? Hollywood lied to us. I was 13 years old. I watched this movie called The Exorcist, and it scared the hell into me. From that point on, I was scared of everything that was demonic. And when I watched The Omen when I was 15, I couldn't sleep most nights because it was the scariest thing I've ever seen because I felt like here was God and here was the devil and it was like and there was the battle and God's going to win. No, no, the devil's going to win. It's like that is so far from the truth, man. That is a lie. God is stronger and mightier. The devil can't even touch you if you trust in him. Can't even come near you. 
God never shrugs. God never slips. God never says, uh-oh. God never has to repent. Never. Because everything that's happened in your life, if you've accepted Christ, is Father filth that he's got you like this. And the enemy throws something and he goes, no, 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 no. He's not ready for that yet. Oh, she can handle that. Come on. And he'll allow something to happen in your life, some kind of turmoil, but he's watching you the whole time. No, no, no. Ah, ah, that's it. I'm not making these things up, guys. This is scripture. You got to know this. This is the milk. You got to know this and live it out. You got to exercise it. Again, definition. Gehenna. Symbolic place of judgment occurs hundreds of times in Scripture. There was no, I couldn't even count how many different times. It was literally hundreds of times there was a reference to hell. Part of speech, noun, feminine, no shock there. <laughs> That's just a joke, baby. <laughs> Yeah, you got the point. Turn it off. <laughs> Gentlemen, would you please hand out the uh, communion elements? Leah, would you please come up? We're going to do communion because it's the last Sunday of the month. And it's a great time to, if you're a young believer, to say, man, I, I got to know these things. I'm going to get that tape, and I'm going to learn these things. I'm going to start studying Hebrews chapter 6, and I'm going to start learning the foundations. And if you're not a new believer, and you've been walking with the Lord, and you go, man, I, I didn't know a lot of those things. It's about time, guys. It's about time. And it's good for you to, during your communion time, as we have a moment of silence and you hold on to the communion elements, it's a good thing for you guys to say, God, I'm going to make the time to know these things. I'm not just going to pick up my Bible on Sunday. I'm going to get a part of a home fellowship. I'm going to get in some kind of accountability group with, with some people that, that love me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my life this life. I'm going to dedicate my life to this life. Yeah, I'll take some. I'll take Leah's too. So, if you're new again, notice it didn't say anything about the Lord's Supper, communion. The Lord Jesus, in speaking about communion, says, when you do this. The same thing he said when you pray. You're going to do this. Communion is part of the basics of church. Now, what we're going to do now is a symbol. It's a symbol of the Lord Jesus. We're going to tell God that he's going to be woven in the very fabric of our life. We're not going to take communion and then go out there and forget about God Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We're going to go out there and we're going to say, no, you will be a part of the fabric of my life. Even as this that represents the body of Christ, as you guys might know. Look at this. This is unleavened bread, otherwise known to the Jews as matzah. It has holes in it because the Lord Jesus' body was pierced. It is burnt because the Lord Jesus was burnt by his friends and it has no leaven. It, 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 it doesn't have anything to make it rise, which in scripture, um, what's it called again? Yeast. We use yeast. They called it leaven. It, it, yeast and, and leaven in scripture was a picture of sin. There was no sin in him. So you look at this thing and you, man, that, that is a representation. Now the Catholics, when I was Catholic, we used to believe that this, uh, in this thing called transubstantiation, where it quite literally became the body and blood of Christ. We don't believe that. It's not scriptural. But we do believe it is a good representation. We, we take it seriously. This ain't no joke to us. We're looking at God and saying, God, be a part of my life. I'll never forget accepting Christ as my Savior. A couple months later, doing something I knew I shouldn't have been doing. Something that I really enjoyed doing. And I remember leaving and going, that was horrible. I used to love this, and now I don't anymore. 
And it's like, I, what's going on in me? God comes and takes residence in our heart. Even when you, if you're one of those people and you're wishy-washy and, 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 and there's things that come in your life and go in your life and you're one of those people, you, you, you become, for some of us, it's like the martial arts. Well, one day we study karate, the next day we study jiu-jitsu, next day we study Muay Thai. And go, one, one, God's not like that. As soon as you start to study Jesus, he says, oh, you're going to study me. Well, what if I don't go to church anymore? Listen, you could hide in your house and never even think about God again, and he's still going to work on you. God doesn't change his mind, even if you do. And some, this is, for some of us, this is really good because we say to ourselves, well, God doesn't change his mind, even when I do. That means God still loves me, even though I haven't been thinking about him in a long time. That's right. God doesn't change his mind. You open your heart and you receive Christ. God said, I'm in, and I'm in forever. And then that's what I'm talking about, those, I did that, and I walked away and did some stupid stuff, and didn't feel good anymore. And if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. It's like, you ever in a grocery store and see a screaming kid? And you look at the poor woman who's got the kid that's going crazy? And if you don't have a kid, and you're looking at her, you're looking at her with judgment. Can this woman get her kid to shut up? But if you already have kids, your eyes are of pity and mercy. <laughs> This poor thing, I know what she's going through. I've been there. It's like all the explaining on one side is not going to help, and on the other side, there's no explanation necessary at all. For you guys to know what I'm talking about, there's no explanation. I don't even have to talk. And you know, oh, Brother Ryan, I know exactly what you're talking about. So I'm going to give you a minute. Lee's going to play some, you guys play this uh, in instrumental or some, and then um, just think about the things we talked about today and anything that I said that touched your heart. Ask God to work it out, okay? And then we'll come back. Don't partake. We'll partake together as a family. So, if you're serious, and if you're ready, the body of Christ wants to renew, rejuvenate, strengthen, wants to do things in and through you that you can't do yourself. The Bible actually says that it's your weakness that makes His strength perfect. The Bible actually says that the word grace is like a power in you that you've never experienced before. If you need that grace, asking God for a power not your own, because it's not by might nor by power, but by His Spirit, says the Lord. Take this with the heart that says, your life and my life, God.
Now, if there's an apprehension, if there is the right attitude that says you don't deserve it because you have done so many terrible things even after you accepted Christ as your Savior. If there's that heart there, you're right. You're right. You don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. But we have what the Lord Jesus called the cup of the new covenant. The representation of his blood. And again, Christianity 101, his blood, faith in him, means that his blood covers your sins. And we've said this before, that grace is when you don't get what you do deserve. I'm sorry, mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve, and grace is when you get what you don't deserve. And because of the blood of Christ, you get grace and mercy. What a great, I love the way that's, again, let me say that again. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. And you've been given mercy, forgiveness of sins, and grace. Now God wants to implore you to do wonderful things for Him. If you're ready for that, you're ready, and you want this cup of the new covenant all over your life, man. I mean, the spiritual aspect of it, of course. The spiritual aspect of having the blood of Christ over every part of your life. Go ahead, take. And now, we're going to celebrate as brothers and sisters and worship together with Alex and Leah.
But I will not point that finger or grow that wicked skin. I cannot remember what I will not forget. Oh, how I broke you. Oh, how I broke you. Me what I cannot buy with gold. Put in me, oh God, come restore my broken soul. Put in me what I cannot give myself. Put in me, 